Hi, everybody. My clock says seven o'clock, so let's get this thing moving. Welcome to a presentation this evening through Zoom by Briar Creek Association for Watershed Solutions. And we thank the Columbia County Conservation District and their watershed specialist, Brittany Hartzell, for hosting this for us. Okay, I'm Mary Jo Gibson, and I'm a Penn State Extension Master Gardener. I also happen to be uh, a charter and lifetime member of Briar Creek Association for Watershed Solutions. And this is our map of Briar Creek Watershed. To give you a little orientation, right about here is Berwick, and this blue line here going along that way is the Susquehanna River. All of this area is the Briar Creek watershed. So let's talk about watersheds for a moment. This is an all-purpose generic diagram of a watershed. And maybe you know what a watershed is, but maybe you don't. Uh, it's a geographical area in which water drains into a body of water like a lake or a river. In our case, it's the Susquehanna River. Uh, you can think of the watershed as the roof of your house. The roof is equivalent to the land, and the land is where the water runs off, and the gutters on your house would be the streams where the water is collected. Now, watersheds include both land and the water, which is also called, the whole area can also be called a drainage basin. This drainage basin collects all of the precipitation as either runoff of the land or it percolates into the soil before re-entering the stream. And tonight's presentation really just epitomizes all of this. We can call tonight's presentation Saving Rain for a Sunny Day. What I'll be talking about tonight are rain gardens and briefly, rain barrels. And this all has to do with a healthy watershed. Okay, here's an overhead view of a typical block in a residential community. There are homes and yards and streets. There are all the roofs, okay? The red represents the roofs of the home. These are impervious surfaces, which means, unless your roof is leaking, the rain doesn't go through them, okay? Let's add another layer of impervious surfaces. There are all the streets and the alleys. So next, let's put in the sidewalks. And now, uh-oh, how did the whole thing become red? Well, it has to do with the fact that Many of us, most of us have turf grass and turf grass, believe it or not, is not that great at allowing water to infiltrate. So let's talk about ways that we can save water, increase infiltration and have a healthier watershed. Okay, now let's talk about rain barrels. What's a rain barrel? Well, it's a collection system. It's old, old, old. It's absolutely nothing new. And it's a collection system that stores rooftop runoff to be used later. What do you use it for? Well, you can use it for watering your lawn and garden, especially the ornamental gardens with flower beds. Uh, not necessarily for watering your vegetable garden though. There's some issues with that possibly. Washing your car, window cleaning, just about anything, okay? What do you need for a rain barrel? You need a roof. It doesn't necessarily have to be on your house. It could be your garage or a shed, large or small, it doesn't matter. You need a, uh, gutters and downspouts. You need some kind of barrel. You need a bucket or a watering can or a hose. and we need some rain, okay? That's all, nothing special, nothing fancy. 
Now, I'm really not going to say too much about rain barrels because just about a year ago, April 18th last year, the Columbia County Conservation District had planned a wonderful presentation on do-it-yourself rain barrels, their benefits, their uses, how to make them and how to maintain them. And thanks to a lot of effort on their part, particularly Brittany's, they put it together as an online Zoom presentation because it wasn't safe to do it in person at that time. And it's all recorded and it's all on the Conservation District's website. All you have to do is go to their website. You can just Google if Columbia County Conservation District. Uh, you might want to throw Pennsylvania in there or you'll find that there are many co Columbia counties in the United States. Often the one in Georgia pops up when I look for it. And look at the tabs across the top, click on workshops, scroll down. You'll see lots of really good presentations that uh, our friends at the Conservation District have been doing in the past year. And there's not only the slide presentation, but also uh, a recording on YouTube. So that is the best way to do it. I also have sent to Brittany and she's posted it on the Because website, a list of resources. And it's very easy to click on the links and just go and get a lot more information. And one of the links you can click on is uh, How to Make a Rain Barrel by Tom Butzler of Penn State Extension. It's part of Penn State three minute gardener series. Okay. So you can just go there and see what he has to say. So let's look at some pretty rain barrels. These are commercially available. They're attached to downspouts. Uh, a couple things that you need to remember, and Brittany goes into all this really well, is you need a hose bib on the bottom so you can get the water out after it's been attached. But see this section here? You really need to raise up the barrel so you can easily get a bucket or a watering can under it. And so it's convenient to attach a hose. You could put it on the ground or on a, a surface like over here, but if you're going to lift it up so you can put like a bucket or a watering can under it, please remember water weighs a lot, okay? Um, a 55 gallon drum is easily going to go over 400 pounds. So whatever you're going to be putting this on, make sure it's good and stable. Also keep, make sure it is stable for the sake of everyone's safety. You don't want it to be top heavy and topple over. Okay. Lots of different ways to hook up a rain barrel. Again, I'm going to go through this at high speed because I'm not going to reinvent the wheel that Brittany did a year ago. But here's the downspout. You can rearrange the downspout, shorten it up a bit so that it goes into the top of the barrel. You can piggyback barrels so that you can save more water just from the same one downspout. There are lots of different ways to do that. You can hook up soaker hoses or an irrigation system. Okay, that works. It's not tricky to do. All right, now, how much runoff are you going to get from your roof? Well, there's my roof. My home is 28 by 40 feet. If you do a little arithmetic, that comes out to a little over 1,000 square feet. And if we have just a quarter of an inch rainstorm, I will have 168 gallons coming down the two downspouts on my house. Okay, that's a lot more than your basic 55 gallon drum. Okay. And again, all of this math business is in all the resources that uh, I've posted for you. And it's also all in Brittany's webinar. Okay, so we're not going to spend time with the how and the why. So if you have a 35 gallon rain barrel or a 50 or a 55 gallon rain barrel, what about the rest of your roof? Okay, where's all that gonna go? What about the surface runoff? I did mention that um, 
turf grass isn't so great at allowing infiltration. It really isn't. It's just a little bit better than concrete, which is rather frightening. So what are you going to do with the rest of the rain? What can you do with it? All that overflow and runoff has to go somewhere. How about a rain garden? Oh, rain gardens are also not very new, but the idea of them has come up really recently. Okay, let's find out some things about rain barrels. I'm sorry, rain gardens. Here we have a typical one. It's very pretty. First of all, it is indeed a beautiful garden. Okay, it's designed to be pretty. And its purpose is to intercept the rain and slow the runoff. It's going to increase the amount of storm water that filters into the ground. Maybe we should talk about why that's important. And it's going to reduce the pollution that's entering the watershed. Okay. Benefits. It is going to trap and treat the pollutants, and they're not going to be an issue for the prettiness in the rain garden. It's going to recharge the groundwater. That's something that really uh, most of us have forgotten about. Uh, probably all of you get your water from a well. It might be a public well or it might be a private well. If you are in Danville area and you have a public water, then you actually do get your water from the Susquehanna River. But that's the only place around here that gets its water from the Susquehanna River. If you're in the Berwick area and you get your water from Pennsylvania American Water Company, you don't get any water from the river. Yes, there is a facility right there along the river, right near the Berwick Bridge. But there's a well there. In fact, I think there are two wells there. Okay. The water doesn't come from the river, it comes from a well. And we need to make sure we are recharging the groundwater. We need to slow down the water, let it trickle down, let it percolate, let it infiltrate through the soil to have a good recharge of the groundwater. Along the way, we're going to restore some natural habitats. We're going to improve soil attract birds and butterflies and other wildlife. And, you know, that's just part of the pretties. And these are low maintenance. We don't have to mow them. Do you have to do a little upkeep once in a while? But it's a no mow zone. And that's our good. And it's just plain pretty. Now, when I started doing these presentations, which was probably about 15 years ago, information out there was really pretty limited. Um, the University of Wisconsin, in combination with Wisconsin's Department of Natural Resources, had a really, really fine manual available. It's still out there and it's been updated. And yes, it's on that research sources sheet that I, I keep mentioning again and again. Uh, about a little bit after that, the Virginia Department of Forestry came up with a fine uh, information booklet. Uh, on rain gardens. At one time, it was five separate downloads. Now it's all in one place. Uh, there's a watershed group out in Ohio. They were also among the first to come up with a really good manual. And these are like, you know, not just, you know, a, a four page thing. These are 30 to uh, 20 or more pages long. These really are good manuals and they give you all kinds of information. Uh, a really good program is popping up now at Rutgers in New Jersey. Uh, one of the things you should always do when you're looking for information is look for science-based, research-based information. And the best place to get that is from the land-grant universities like Penn State, Rutgers, Cornell, Ohio State, University of Maryland. 
uh, University of Wisconsin, look for these land grant universities because then you're going to get unbiased information. Uh, the Yukon has a great website and nowadays there's an app for that, okay? Yes, Yukon has a rain garden app and it's free and it's for both iPhones and Androids. So how are we going to go about building a rain garden? Well, pay a little bit of attention to the type of soil, how much shade there is in the area because the type of soil, but especially the sunlight is going to impact what kinds of plants you put in the rain garden. Decide on a size, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Where would this be a good place to put? Okay, think about the slope of your land. And you say, well, my land's flat. Well, it probably isn't flat. Look at it again. And how are you going to prepare the, the planting area? What are you going to plant? And are you going to mulch it? Maybe you shouldn't. And you are going to need to water it. Yes, it's a rain garden, but you're going to need to water it just a little bit during the first growing season, okay? Give me a moment, please. Thanks. Okay, this is kind of overkill. You don't need to go through all this. You don't need to dig out a really deep area and put a bunch of rocks and perforated pipe in the bottom. That's really very, very unnecessary in almost all cases. <clears throat> if the area has a huge amount of clay, maybe you'll need to talk with the conservation district and get some detailed information. But let's keep it simple, okay? Let's not make it too complex. And remember, a rain garden is a planted area. It's a depression. It is not a pond. That's a whole other thing. Okay, now what are we going to do here? Here are, is the downspout, okay, from the roof, and it's going into a rain barrel. And this rain barrel is set up so that the overflow from the when the barrel fills up from a rainstorm, the overflow is directed toward this kind of a U-shaped rain garden. Okay, we have another downspout here. Here's another area. And this grating is sloping away from the house to the rain garden. That's important that the slope is going away from your home. Okay. Rain gardens are almost always U-shaped, and you'll see on the next slide how this works. Okay, here's your basic handy dandy house. Okay, here's a slope going toward the back, and here's a rain garden right here. Now, this is about 30 feet from the downspout. Okay, theoretically, if you really wanted to, you could run the downspout right down to there, but you don't need to. You're just going to run off on the, the soil, on the turf anyway. And here's a little berm. We'll talk more about the downslope berm. And on this side, this rain garden is really pretty close to the home and to the downspout. It's about 10 feet away. Okay, it's really close. You have to be careful with that because the bottom of the rain garden is where there's going to be water infiltrating down into the ground. And it's going to infiltrate, infiltrate pretty quickly, uh, usually in three days, usually in one to two days, but it won't be more than three days. Okay. So, but you still don't want this near your home because around here, just about everybody has a basement or a cellar. Okay. In some parts of the United States, people don't have basements and cellars, and then it doesn't matter too much. But this is a slight slope out to the front. Here's the street or the road, and here's the berm again. Okay, but we want it to be at least 10 feet away. 
Now, how big are you going to make the rain garden? That's really up to you. Generally, and okay, generalizations, the area of the garden should be about 25% of the drainage area. Okay, if we go back to my roof, just one side of the roof is about 600 feet. Okay, it's less than that, but let's keep it simple for the case of math. So if 600 feet of roof goes down, let's say my front, my front uh, yard, down to the downspout, then the garden area might be about 150 square feet. Okay, 150 square feet is 25% of my front roof. Or I, that's maybe 10 by 15. You can make it any size you want, but let's keep the math simple. Now, you might want to make it larger if your soil contains a whole lot of clay. Or maybe you want to make sure that you're gathering the water from all the largest storms. You're not going to have any runoff at all. Or you simply really want to get into doing rain gardens. Maybe you want to make it smaller. If you live in a really sandy place with a lot of really permeable soil, you can make it smaller. Um, or maybe you just don't have that much room. And that's okay. The size of your rain garden really is up to you. Now, plan, plan, plan. Mark out the area. Okay, an easy way to mark out an area is to take a garden hose and just loop it around, see what it looks like, see how big it is. Um, garden hoses are really good. A simple way to mark it, you don't need to go buy a can of upside down paint. Nope. You can just use lime that maybe you put on your lawn or let's keep it simple. Get out the bag of flour and just sprinkle flour all on the grass, on the area. And that's an easy way to indicate your rain garden. Okay. Now, before you dig, absolutely before you dig, call 811. It's a free call. It's the Pennsylvania One Call System. It actually is nationwide. You can Google 811 and they will tell you what is underneath your, your land in any spot. Uh, sometimes they can tell you promptly. In most cases, it takes a day or two or three. So plan ahead. <clears throat> Be safe. You certainly don't want to run into any gas lines when you're digging. You don't want to run into any electrical utility lines. Okay. Call before you dig, please. So you've figured out where you want to put it. You've found out it's a good, safe place to dig. How are you going to do this? Okay. Here is the slope. And this would be 10 feet for the width of your rain garden. Okay. Put out a string and a stake. Okay. This is six inches right here. Okay. Rain gardens are shallow. Okay. Um, lots of them are four inches. Some of them are six inches. None of them should be over eight inches. Okay. You want this to be a really shallow area and it's going to still be sloped. Okay. So mark out a string, mark out your area. And what you're going to do is you're going to dig out, here's the original ground line right through here where the red marker is going, okay? That's the original. You're going to dig that out and put it over here and make the berm. So as the water runs down slope, it's going to fill in this area and it's going to stop because of the berm. Okay, that's why they're almost always U-shaped. It might be a shallow U, it might be a steeper U, but there's always a berm there that's going to slow it down. Now, this is where the garden part comes in. All of this section down here is where you're going to put the pretties, okay? And I'm gonna go through a lot of the pretties because that's what I like best. Now, here's... A rain garden here the downspout is going directly into it okay 
Problem is, this is really close to the foundation of the home, unless it's on a slab. But the way it looks, it might not be on a slab. It could actually have uh, a cellar under there. So that's something you would need to put a little further away. It doesn't look to me like it's a 10 foot minimum distance, but maybe it's on a slab, but 10 feet is better. Now you see all these nice yellow flowers here? Yeah, well, there's a lot of those. First of all, it is goldenrod. Second, you're not allergic to it. No, I know, I know. You see goldenrod blooming and you start sneezing. Sorry, you're still not allergic to goldenrod. Very, very, very few people are. Uh, goldenrod pollen is big and heavy and sticky. And if it falls off the flower, it literally falls to the ground from gravity. It is not lightweight and doesn't blow in the air. So unless you're sticking your face right in a pile of goldenrod and inhaling deeply, you're not going to ever get any goldenrod pollen up in your sinuses. The however is, there's a very quiet little plant that grows and blooms at the same time goldenrod does. It's called ragweed. And ragweed is wind pollinated. So please stop blaming goldenrod for your sneezes. It's ragweed. The other thing is there's so much goldenrod here. I must tell you, goldenrod is a native plant. It is not invasive. <sighs> yes, it's an aggressive grower. There are some kinds of goldenrod that are better behaved. Uh, so rather than putting in goldenrod, pick your goldenrod carefully or use other plants because it is an enthusiastic grower and it may crowd other things out. And we want this to be pretty. We don't want it to be a weedy mess. By the way, the Euro goldenrod is native to North America. The Europeans got all excited when they found out about our goldenrod. And it's the plant breeders in Europe who bred it and changed its behavior. And so there are some now really well-behaved cultivars. I had the opportunity to visit Ireland uh, a couple years ago. And I laughed. Every garden I went to had beautiful, well-behaved goldenrod in it. It was great. They think it's really cool over there. Now, there are swales, okay? Here we have on the right side, we have the road. And here is a depression down here, okay? All kinds of plants here. And you have to admit, it's pretty, okay? Now, there's another way you can look at this. Up here, the water is going to start flowing down. Here as it goes. It goes, it uses the grass as a filter. It keeps on moving down. It goes into the rain garden here. And this is actually set up so that the overflow from the rain garden, if there is a very steep, uh, a heavy storm, it's going to go into the storm drain. But all of this along the way is filtering out uh, pollutants. It's allowing water to infiltrate, infiltrate to restore the groundwater. And yet if it's too much, we, we'll go into the storm drain. All the storm drains do is, well, they should be separate systems, but it either overpowers the sewage treatment facility or it goes whoosh right into the river and away it goes. We really need to try to slow down all the runoff so it doesn't go into storm drains for those of you who live in town. Okay, there are parking areas now. There is this wonderful stuff called porous pavement. It doesn't look that unusual. Uh, you have to kind of limit the weight of vehicles that's on it. Uh, but there is porous pavement, but why not just ever so gently slope the paved parking lot so that when the water runs, instead of having it go into a storm drain and whoosh away, let's have it go into an elongated, kind of, sort of, like a ditch, rain garden, okay? And it's not going to go anywhere. It's just going to accumulate there. And within one or two, possibly three days, it's going to infiltrate 
soil. Okay. Now, let's get to my favorite part. There are rain garden plants that really are well designed for rain gardens. And these aren't anything terribly unusual. Uh, when somebody asks, asks me for a recommendation for plants, I will ask about sunlight. Is it going to be full sun, including blazing hot late afternoon sun? Is it a shaded area? Does it get morning sun? Does it get sun all day long? I will also usually ask, well, is this a dry area? Is this a moist area? And often people have to kind of stop and think about that. Well, if you're going to put plants into a rain garden, please realize that the rain garden is going to be wet right after it rains. It's going to be wet for a day, maybe two, possibly three. And then it's going to be dry for several days until it gets around to raining again. So rain garden plants have to tolerate both wet and dry soils. Now, I have listed a bunch of my favorite rain garden plants. They are all native to this part of Pennsylvania. And I have Columbia County Conservation District's logo on here. And often when I do this presentation, I will, well, sometimes it happens before they have their annual native plant sale. In this case, they've uh, scheduled their native plant sale in March. Unfortunately, it was canceled last year. And they had it by pre-order only. Uh, so, you know, when you order plants, you have to order a certain number. And maybe they had orders for 20 and maybe the plants came in uh, flats of 25. Okay, so there might be a few leftover plants available. They are going to make these plants available to the public on Saturday, May 8th. Please check their website for the time. Uh, everything that was pre-ordered, they're going to give you uh, an assigned time to come pick them up. We still need to be careful with the pandemic. Okay, Eastern White Pines. Uh, to me, this was our Charlie Brown Christmas tree one year. Uh, they make kind of weird Christmas trees because when they're young and Christmas tree size, they tend to be kind of lanky looking. Uh, they do fill in nicely. And then when they get really big, they lose the pointy conical top on them and they actually become flat topped. These trees, and yes, you put trees in a rain garden or next to a rain garden, depending how big your rain garden is going to be. Maybe you don't want something as big as the eastern white pine. Okay, let's look at another tree. This is our native red maple. Okay, when people talk about red maples, they could mean three completely unrelated kinds of maples. They might mean uh, Japanese maples that have finely divided leaves that happen to come in reds and purples and bronze and, and yellows often in red. So people think that's a red maple. Well, it's a Japanese maple with red leaves. They might mean uh, a big tree that has a leaf kind of, sort of, not really, but a little bit like uh, the leaf on the Canadian flag. That's really a sugar maple, but Norway maple leaves are similar in appearance. And there are varieties called Crimson King and Crimson Queen, okay? They have reddish purple leaves all year round, except in fall when they just kind of turn brown and fall off. But the true red maple, Acer rubrum, is our wonderful tree. It has brilliant red leaves, carmen. Oh, beautiful, beautiful red leaves in the fall. The petiole, the leaf stem is red and the flowers. Yes, maples get flowers. They're not fancy showy flowers, but they're little and they're really important to our pollinators. 
uh, the pop, the flowers are red. Okay. The cool thing about red maples is they don't care if they're, if they have wet feet or dry feet. Okay. It's a great tree. It lives just about everywhere. This was, I think, my mother's favorite tree. The black gum, also called tupelo, turns red first in the fall. It's absolutely scarlet. Uh, the rest of the year, the leaves are nice and oval and kind of a shiny green. This is another uh, tree that has lots of choices when it comes to wet or dry feet. Okay, There are some trees, by the way, that must have wet feet and others must have dry feet. But the trees and plants I'm showing you are really tolerant of change. Okay, this is, eh, when we're talking rain gardens, this is one of my favorite trees. This is the river birch. Just based on its name, you realize that it doesn't mind having wet feet and it grows wild as a huge tree all up and down the Susquehanna River. There are cultivated varieties, cultivars, if you will, that are really beautiful. They are smaller. They're more adapted for homeowner use, for residential areas. Uh, there's one called Heritage White that has that way cool exfoliating, which means peeling off white almost bark. Uh, some are whiter, some are peachier in colors, but it makes such beautiful winter interest. And it stays a nice size and it doesn't care if its feet are wet or dry. It also is resistant to borers. Uh, many of the white barked birches are non-native and many, many of them uh, have major issues with leaf miners and with borers. And that means that either the tree is going to die young or you're going to spend a whole lot of time maintaining it, usually with insecticides. So get the right plant for the right place and you're ahead of the game. Uh, right now, the service berries are pretty much done blooming. They were the little white trees popping up all over in the woods uh, a week or two ago. Uh, these are really cool. They have all kinds of names. They're, my mother called them May cherries, but they bloom in April and they're not cherries, but that's what she called them anyway. Uh, they're also called June berries because that's when the delicious fruit become ripe if you can get to it before the birds do, it's fantastic. Makes really good pies. And um, it's called service berry for, I think, a cool reason. Uh, when the tree bloomed, the ground was thawed enough to have funeral services for those who died in the winter. And it's called shad bush or shad blow because it's blooming at the time the shad are running in the rivers. Okay. There are many, many species and lots of hybrids, and they're absolutely beautiful. In the fall, their leaves are rusty colored. And I have one right in the middle of my backyard growing on top of Rusty the Gordon Setter's grave. And my daughter didn't ask me, she asked her brother to get her a tree that had rusty colored leaves in the fall. So I have a service berry right in the middle of my backyard. Now, this is without a doubt my favorite small tree, whether it's for a rain garden or anything else. Remember rain garden trees are very flexible with the type of soil, whether it's wet or moist, okay? This is the red bud. And if you're from the area, this is what's right now blooming between Berwick and Bloomsburg along Route 11. Oh, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, in addition to the straight species being beautiful, there are uh, several cultivars. The one in the picture is forest pansy and it has purple leaves. Um, I have one of those. My son gave it to me many years ago because he got tired of listening to me ooh and awe over it. So he got forest pansy and it's set 
right there next to my stone wall and I have purple leaves with all the other green leaves. And a few years ago, he gave me rising sun, which starts out with yellow and orange leaves. They're positively golden right now. And then they turn to a light yellow green, kind of chartreuse. All the red buds, no matter what variety they are, have those beautiful reddish pink flowers that are starting in nature right now. I really thought by the time I got home from work today, my red buds would have burst open all the way. They aren't. I went over and had a conversation with them and tomorrow, uh, well, I'd say probably with tomorrow's weather being a little cooler and rainy and cloudy, I'll give them until after work on Friday and then they'll be magnificent. Now let's get a little bit smaller. Let's move from trees down to shrubs. The red twig dogwood is another, all of these that I'm talking about are native. If you're going to take the time to put in a rain garden, why not make them all native plants? There's lots and lots of reasons that would be a, at least a two hour presentation on why native plants are better than exotics. And there are some exotics that are evil and invasive, but there are lots of well-behaved exotics, but nothing can be putting natives in the habitat. Okay, here we have red twig dogwood. Uh, the twigs really are red. If you let them go, eventually about the time they start getting big like your thumb, they start losing the red color and become kind of reddish brown. If you want to keep them red, what I've been known to do is go out and reach down into the center. Don't go around and chop it off. That's going to take away the beauty, the natural beauty of the branching. Reach down into the center of the shrub with your pruning shears, cut off some branches right down at the bottom and take them in and put, make them part of your holiday decorations. The red color is gorgeous. Okay, and every time you go in there and take out the largest branches, it's just going to make more the next year. So you always have red branches there for winter interest. Um, this is a dogwood. It doesn't have big four petaled flowers. Instead, it has a cluster of tiny four petaled flowers. Okay. Most of the dogwoods, and there are lots and lots out there, don't have the giant petals. They have clusters of small ones. Summer sweet is clethra. Oh my goodness, it smells so good. Uh, there's a variety called hummingbird, which oh, is just a great plant. There's one called ruby spice. Uh, and yes, it really is pinkish. Uh, this one can stand, once it's established, uh, drier soil, but it absolutely loves having dampish soil. So this is the kind that you would put in the deepest part of the rain garden bowl, okay? Winterberry, this is an ilex, this is a holly. Not all hollies keep their thick evergreen leaves. This is a deciduous holly, its leaves are thin. So in the winter, the leaves fall off, but you have the beautiful branches and on the females, because hollies come in boys and girls, the females have the beautiful fruit. Uh, there are several different varieties available in the landscape. Uh, there's one called berry heavy, which is a large red one. There's berry heavy gold, which is orangey gold colored. And um, my son says, yeah, mom, they're the really good ones because the birds don't eat them. Well, yes, they do. Uh, they are really a little on the big side for the birds to just gobble down and they're a little too dense. But by as the uh, berries go through the winter, they get softer and the birds will eat even the biggest winter berry fruits later on in the wintertime. Uh, usually, I know where there are some patches of wild ones in my buddy's woods. Um, in the wild, I almost always find them in damp areas, drainage ditches, roadsides. Uh, they'd like to have wet feet, but they can tolerate dry. 
and I'll go harvest those. And it keeps the, the berries growing further down on the stem so it's easy to harvest. And they're the little berries and I put them in my uh, outdoor arrangements in my containers on the deck. And usually by about mid-January, if I put these out in mid-December, by mid-January, the berries are all gone because the birds have eaten them. They don't mind. We have lots of viburnums out in the landscape. Viburnum dentatum is the native one. It's called arrowwood. Uh, all the viburnums have clusters of tiny flowers. Uh, arrowwood's tiny white flower clusters turn into clusters of blue black, blue black fruits. Again, really good for bird food. American cranberry bush is not the little cranberry that lives in swamps or wetlands, okay? This is a big viburnum and gets beautiful red fruits. Again, great for the birds, okay? Everybody's got to eat. There are grasses that don't mind having wet feet or dry feet. Uh, I'm just putting one in just to mention it. There's, this is a switchgrass. The panicum grasses are great. Uh, there are different varieties. There's heavy metal, which tends to be kind of bluish green. There uh, is ruby something, something ruby. And uh, ruby ribbons, that sounds good. And uh, that actually gets burgundy leaves, especially later in the summer. And of course, it's a grass, so it gets little seeds. And this is something you don't go out in the fall and cut these down. You wait until spring to do your cleanup and the birds have everything all eaten off. It's just great. The little goldfinches will frolic around in those. Now, there is a little creeping phlox. Many of the phloxes are native, not all, but many. And this is phlox stolonifera. Um, I actually had a, a person contact me last year and say, what is this? I think I know where I got it, but I don't know what it is. And my reply was, it's creeping phlox, phlox stolonifera, and I bet you got it from the conservation district plant sale. And they said, yes, I did. Okay, cardinal flowers are butterfly and hummingbird magnets. Uh, cardinal flowers like to have damp feet. This is another plant that you would really want to put in the deepest part where it's going to be a little wetter, a little bit longer. And cardinal flowers are kind of funny. Uh, they move. Uh, they might be happy in one place for two years, maybe three years. And the next time you see it, it's not going to be exactly in that spot. It seems to have moved to somewhere else. And wherever it goes, it is happier there. So don't try to put it back. Let it find its happy spot. Um, they move up and down creeks like crazy. And they will likely move around within your rain garden. But that's okay. Here's a late blooming plant. New England asters, and when I see them in the wild, they're almost always along the road in a drainage ditch. As you are planning the plants to put into your rain garden, remember something called continuous bloom. Okay, uh, Drive up and down the road, do some identification, go repeatedly to your friendly neighborhood nursery ask about native plants, but go several times because often they will have what's available in the trade and they'll have it when it's in bloom, okay? New England asters can be out there in the nursery, but they're sitting there like little green leaves in a pot right now. This is something that's going to grow throughout the summer and toward the end of August, it's going to begin blooming and it's going to bloom all through September and into October. Okay, you want something blooming in all different times in the season. Uh, you're really not going to find a tree, a shrub or a herbaceous perennial that's going to bloom all the time. Okay, each has its preferred time to bloom, whether it's spring, late spring, early summer, summertime, late summer, or in the fall. Each has its time to bloom, and it's going to bloom for maybe three or four weeks. If you're lucky, it'll bloom for six weeks. 
Now, there are lots of sedums or stone crops. These are little creepy crawly guys. They don't get too tall. There are other sedums that do get tall. There is one, really, that is native, and that's sedum ternatum, and it is blooming right now. Okay, little low white flowers. There are other sedums that are pretty well behaved, although they tend to take over a little bit. And some of them have pink flowers, some of them have yellow flowers, uh, leaves of different colors. But sedum ternatum is absolutely cute and adorable. And everywhere where the branch, uh, the stems touch the ground, it roots in. So it forms a really nice mat. Is it going to keep the weeds out? Probably not, but it still looks great. Okay, let's talk about milkweeds because everybody always wants to know what they can do for the butterflies, especially the monarchs. Okay, what you may or may not realize is all the flowers, almost, will provide nectar for all the adult butterflies, including the monarchs. But monarchs will only lay their eggs on milkweeds, and it's only the milkweeds that their larvae will eat. So if you want milkweed caterpillars, you need to plant milkweeds so mom can find it and put her eggs on it. Swamp milkweed was first described in a swamp. Hmm. It likes moist to average soil. Okay. If they found it first in an average area, it would have a completely different name, but it was first described from a swamp. Uh, the flowers are pink. Uh, some of them get pretty tall. Uh, Cinderella is a little shorter and a little pinker. There's a variety called Ice Ballet that's white. Okay. Now, what if your soil... Well, and you can put these in not just the rain garden, but in your regular flower beds too. What if your soil is on the average to dry side? Well, the swamp milkweed goes in the deeper section of the rain garden, up on the rim of the rain garden, where it's not going to be wet much of the time. Let's put butterfly milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa. Uh, the leaves are a little bit tougher, a little bit thicker, but she'll, the monarch will still lay her eggs on it. The pods are slender and elongated, and the flowers are bright orange. There's a variety called Hello Yellow that really is yellow. And what I warn everybody, if they are purchasing milkweeds or purchasing milkweed seeds, you kind of have to be careful with them. Most of the milkweed seeds have to undergo stratification, which means you plant them in the fall, let them go through winter outside, and that's going to soften the seed coat, and they will naturally germinate when spring comes along. They also tend to thrive on neglect. Uh, butterfly milkweed is one of the few milkweeds that doesn't need to be planted in the fall. I planted mine in the spring with everything else. And that was a summer when I was traveling. So the poor things kind of hung in there all by themselves. And I came back and apologized to them and stuck them in the ground. And they said, okay, we like it here. Now, what you have to do with any milkweed that you plant, but especially with Asclepius tuberosa is mark where you put it. The milkweeds are very slow to awaken in the spring. And you might think, oh, I lost it. It didn't make it through the winter. Or you might say, oh, here's a spot in the flower bed. Let's put something here. Well, let me tell you, they don't like being planted on top of. So always mark where they are and never take that marker off. Monarda or bee balm comes in all shades of white, pinks, roses, and the ever popular red. This is Monarda didyma. It likes moisture areas. It doesn't mind what you where you put it, though. There is another one, uh, Monarda fistulosa, which has pinker flowers, and it loves drier areas. I usually see it along highways. Absolute hummingbird magnet, okay? 
uh, starts blooming midsummer and will bloom through pretty much the rest of the season. It does spread. Uh, please be sure to let it run a bit, but watch out. You have to give it good air circulation. Otherwise, it's going to get mildew. Even the mildew resistant varieties will get mildew if you let them get too crowded. Another late season bloomer is black eyed Susans. Again, they don't mind if they're wet or dry footed. They tend to prefer a little bit on the drier side, but they tolerate wet. Okay, so here we have the sidewalk area, a tree, the rain garden. Okay, notice please how very deeply these roots go down. Okay. Turf grass roots really go down two, maybe three inches, if you're lucky, four inches, where all these plants that I've been talking about have roots that go down six inches, 10 inches, 12 inches, okay? Really deep rooted plants. Now, usually somewhere along the line, somebody, when we're talking about rain barrels or rain gardens, they say, well, you know, aren't we going to get mosquitoes? Well, maybe you will. Probably you won't. Not if you do certain things. Okay. Even though there are lots of kinds of mosquitoes out there, mosquitoes take about seven days to complete their life cycle. Uh, the first three stages, the eggs, the larva called a wiggler, and the pupa that looks like a chubby comma, are aquatic. They have to be in the water. Remember, we're not building a pond. We're building a rain garden that's going to hold the water so it can infiltrate into the soil. And it's not going to have water in it in three days. Okay, so mosquitoes aren't a problem. Oh, well, are you sure? Yeah. Um, most of the mosquitoes around here don't fly very far. We have some newer species that have been introduced to the area. They can fly, but most of the time they stay pretty close to home. Uh, I had a mosquito person tell me one time, if you're bitten by a mosquito, you can probably look around and figure out where that mosquito came from. Uh, an upside down Frisbee can produce 3,000 mosquitoes in one season. Yeah, so do a property patrol. Uh, look for containers that are holding water, look for leaky faucets that might have like a perpetual puddle. There is no way to store a tire exposed to the weather that it's not going to hold water and therefore breed mosquitoes. Uh, remember to turn the wheelbarrows upside down uh, toys, you know, Tonka trucks out there, they're going to hold water. Bird baths, you should dump the water out every couple days and put fresh in. It's better for the birds and it's going to stop the mosquitoes. Uh, old pools that aren't being maintained is always an issue. Pools that are being used aren't a problem because the filter's running. Okay. Uh, check out ponds. Gutters and downspouts. One time I couldn't figure out what was going on. I was being eaten alive on my front porch, which is a second story front porch. The mosquitoes never went up that high. I couldn't figure out what was going on. I was out by the road mowing the grass and looked back at the house and went, oh, we had a very icy winter. There was an ice dam and my rain gutter across the front had bellied. And I actually had rain and water not going down the downspout. And that's where all the mosquitoes were coming from. Got the, down, got the rain gutter adjusted. Life was good again. Okay. If you're in town, look out at the storm drains in the street. Take a flashlight and look down there. Sometimes there actually can be standing water down there. What can you do about standing water? Well, 
there is naturally occurring bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis. And it works on mosquitoes. It works on those nasty biting gnats. Um, the dunks look like donuts and they're designed to toss into a pool or a, uh, a pond or a decent body of water. Uh, you don't need a whole dunk for a rain barrel or a small area. You can break it up and put little bits in. Uh, the company has now invented mosquito bits and it looks like granola cereal. And that works really well at, well at managing mosquito larvae in places where you can't dump the water out. So what can we use a rain garden and a rain barrel for? Let's summarize. It's going to intercept rain and slow the runoff, okay? Increase the amount of stormwater that filters into the ground, and we need the stormwater to infiltrate the ground to recharge our groundwater because that's where we get our water is from wells. And it's raining. And we need to reduce pollution entering the watershed. Now, what's way cool is while you're going and considering a rain garden, did you realize that? The Columbia County Conservation District has a Better Backyard Certification Program. Check it out on their website. There is a step-by-step -step application to fill out. Penn State has a Pollinator-Friendly Garden Certificate. Uh, so do other groups. The Audubon Society has one. Uh, their Certified Backyard Habitat Program. National Wildlife Federation has a Certified Wildlife Habitat. If you are going to invest some time in making a rain garden, why not figure out if you can get certified as a better backyard or even a pollinator friendly garden? Check it out. Now, I've been talking off and on about the resources sheet. It's there on the Because Briar Creek Association for Watershed Solutions. Okay, it's on our website, which is part of Columbia County Conservation District, and it's full of links. They were all live last week, and you can get all the details that you want. But wait, wait, there's more. Okay, Columbia County Conservation District's native plant sale. Uh, the pre-order time was back in March. They'll have a pickup time for leftovers in early May. Check out their website for details. Periodical cicadas. Oh, for those of you who know me, I'm really buggy. Uh, periodical cicadas might maybe perhaps be coming to a backyard near you, but then again, maybe they won't be. I will be talking about them next month, same time, same place, Wednesday evening, May 19th. Uh, from seven, it's probably going to be about till eight, but I always give myself some elbow room because I talk too much. Spotted lanternflies, uh, we are likely to see them. If not this year, then we're likely to see them next year for sure in our backyards. What should you or shouldn't you do about them? I'm doing a presentation for Because and again for the Columbia County Conservation District. So if you can't make it in June, try for August. And the spotted lanternflies, favorite tree is the tree of heaven. Uh, I'll be talking about identifying it and managing it in July because that's the time to start managing it. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I am a Penn State Extension Master Gardener of Columbia County. All the counties have a similar email address. It's the county name mg at psu.edu. And you can send your questions to the master gardeners who are staffing the hotline. Most of the extension offices are still closed because of the pandemic. I suspect that's going to change sometime this summer, but my crystal ball is cloudy on just when. But uh, you can send your questions by email and we have master gardeners staffing the hotline through email. If you're going to do that, 
please do put in your full contact information. Uh, describe what your question is. And if you're going to attach photos, that's really a great way to do it. Please put a ruler or a coin in with the photo so we can see how big leaves are or how big a bug is or just what's going on. And there's the end of the commercial messages. Okay. Now, Brittany, I cannot see the chat or questions or anything else? Do we have any? It doesn't look like we have any questions at the moment. If anyone does have any, feel free to type them in the chat box. Okay, how about if I remember what I'm doing and push a button to stop sharing so I can see y'all. Ah, there you are. Ben is invisible. Hi, Ben. I know you're there. There's Tom and Carol. Hello. Hi, Kim. And there's Susan. Who else is here tonight? Okay. Anybody have any questions for me? I have gone a tad over an hour, but that's okay. I hope. If you have any wise words of wisdom, please unmute yourself. Do I see Ben? I almost see Ben. Yes. <laughs> Question? Uh, yes. So let's say somebody is going to try to put together a budget for uh, a smaller rain garden. Maybe they can't do um, the ratio, you know, that would be optimal where they would, you know, work for the, you know, the, the specific size of their structure, the roof, like you said, the footprint, mm -hmm. you know, like what, you know, just a small rain that might help with uh, just a regular little shower, you know, what, is there any idea of, you know, like a budget? I've never really paid attention to the budget. Uh, generally, you can get small perennials, uh, for more or less $5 a piece. And depending on the size of the rain garden, uh, you could put them maybe a foot or two feet apart. Uh, you can also start perennials from seed. And that would be a really inexpensive way of doing it. It's You're gonna need to wait a bit. Uh, generally, uh, one doesn't mulch rain gardens, and one of the one of the reasons not to mulch a rain garden is as the rain flows in, it's probably going to move the mulch, um, and then you won't like the way it looks, and you'll fuss about it. Uh, a lot of people use some kind of uh, shredded wood or uh, chunks of bark, and the chunks of bark are guaranteed to float. Uh, pine bark mulch doesn't move that much, depending how you have it all set up. If it's just, if the water's flowing like a sheet over the lawn, uh, it's not going to be flowing as fast as if you have it coming right out of a downspout. But generally, we don't mulch rain gardens, which means we're going to need to get in there every once in a while and do a little weeding, especially until the plants get established. And as I said at the beginning, you might actually need to get out there and water it to, before these plants get established. And once they're established and you don't need to. But the idea of a rain garden is you're going to pick plants that like to spread and they're going to spread into each other. And that's going to make it really good at infiltration. It's also going to keep the weeds out. But I'll have Thank to... You. You're, you're welcome. I have to think about budgeting. I've never really paid attention to that. Um, you don't need anything except a shovel to do some digging and, you know, a piece of string so you can keep track of where you're going and how far you're digging down and making the berm. So as far as constructing it, you don't need fancy soil. You don't need any fancy equipment. Uh, you do need to put some plants in 
and you need to pick plants that are very flexible with water requirements. And ideally, they're going to spread. Now, there's something I didn't say throughout all of this. And the, the resource and the link is in the resources sheet. All the plants that I mentioned tonight are deer resistant. Um, Rutgers University has a really good database of plants uh, rated by deer resistance and it's four different categories. One is rarely damaged, one is basically once in a while damaged, one is frequently damaged, and the last category is don't bother planting it, it's deer candy. And Rutgers classifies everything that way. Most of the plants that I went through tonight were in the rarely damaged category, and there were just a couple that are once in a while damaged, but they outgrow it, okay? So I think that's really good because everybody says, well, what about the deer? Well, if you pick your plants carefully, most of the time the deer aren't going to bother them. Thank, that's, that's really useful and helpful because this is something that, in my humble opinion, you know, anybody can do. If you've got a shovel and, and you can afford some seeds, which you should be able to, you know, just an, a nice assortment of them, this is something that you could do and really cut back on the amount of water that's just shooting straight to our creeks and causing flooding, or yes. at least ex exacerbating flooding. Right, and uh, the other thing that's really good is Columbia County Conservation District does have their annual plant sale and their natives and their babies. Now, they use the, the uh, proceeds from their plant sale to benefit their education program, especially their youth education program. So yes, it's a fundraiser, but they are selling baby plants and many of on their list, in fact, everything I mentioned tonight was on the list, if not this year in a, the last couple years, but these are native plants and they're really good at what they do and they grow into each other. Uh, these are also plants that are from right around here. You know, it's not like they're prairie plants. Okay, any other thoughts, ideas or comments? Otherwise I'm going to say good night because I was busy today and I have stuff I need to do yet tonight. Thank Please. you. Thank you're, you, Mary Jo. You're welcome. Please do check the Conservation District's website. There is so much information there. They, the only really good thing, if there is a good thing that came out of this pandemic is that we figured out a different way to do communication and it's recorded and we can go back and check on it later. Okay, so the conservation di district is absolutely full of really good ideas. And if nothing else, check out their Better Backyard certification program. It's not hard to do. And yes, there's a webinar on that. <laughs> Thank okay. you so much. It was great. You're welcome. Good yes, night. Thank <laughs> you.